Well, hello again, Gary Stearman. And it's a pleasure to be with you once again. In studio today, our operations director, Bob Ulrich. Hi, Bob. Gary, good to be here with you today. You've got uh, another interesting, uh, interesting article that you've written on a very pertinent subject, and you're here to set the record straight, aren't you? Well, I'll try, <laughs> at, at, which is what we've been trying to do now for decades. We study Bible prophecy. We give our opinion based on Scripture. And Bob, as you know, there's a big question on the minds of many students of Bible prophecy these days, and that question is, does biblical prophecy point to an Islamic Antichrist? And I think the question is based upon the rapid growth of Islam. Many have said that uh, perhaps the coming Antichrist will be uh, Islamic. Perhaps he'll set up some kind of an Islamic rule. And let's just start uh, by discussing why this may have risen to such importance as a, a current question. Well, it's very fashionable right now. There's been a whole series of books, uh, one after another, that have been written, you know, discussing this exact subject, and it's gaining popularity. You know, starting back in 1983 uh, with Yasser Arafat, the Islamic movement has grown through a series of intifadas, or uprisings. We're seeing these uprisings everywhere, Bob, and it's caused people to say, well, go, maybe Yasser Arafat started the ball rolling in a certain way. It's kind of fascinating that it was in 1983 that he fled from Lebanon. Uh, the Israelis were about to capture him. He went to Tunis, and there in Tunisia, he founded what became the PLO with its many intifadas or uprisings. And so you could say that from 1983 to the present, this whole thing has grown like a snowball. And so people are saying, well, maybe the Antichrist will come out of this series of Arab uprisings. Gary, we're watching Israel, this little postage stamp in the mm -hmm. middle of the world, being surrounded by enemies round and about, just exactly as the Bible predicted. And of course, I find it fascinating that Arafat fled in 1983, because if you read Psalm 83, he couldn't come up with a better summation of where we are today. A lot of people are looking at this psalm right now, and they're wondering, is this a war that's about to happen? Is mm -hmm. this something right on the horizon? I just want to read the first few verses of this, because I think it is important. It says, Keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, be not still, O God, for lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up thy head, their head. They've taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They've said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. They've consulted together with one consent. They're confederate against thee, the tabernacles of Edom, the Ishmaelites of Moab, the Hagarenes, Gabal, Ammon, Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. Assur also is joined with them. They've whole the children of Lot. So here you have all these nations named in Psalm 83, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, all of them are still here, and they're all and enemies of Israel. What I see is a, an increasing rabble, uh, rabble rousing against uh, the Israelis, as in let's wipe them out totally and be done with them once and for all. Well, we know from Scripture that's not going to happen. Yes, we do. In fact, you could get your Bible out on your own and read the end of Psalm 83. I'm not going to read it today, but it's God's response, you know, to these enemies of Israel. One thing we should mention quickly as we go on, and that is that uh, Islam is divided between Sunnis and Shiites. The Sunnis of uh, Arabia, uh, under the Arabian kings, essentially believe that there is coming a great leader now, they believe he'll be elected from uh, among the people, and he will establish a great caliphate. That is a huge, huge uh, Islamic territory that covers the entire Middle East, and maybe even Europe. This is, this is their hope. The Shiites, on the other hand, believe that their Mahdi, their Holy One, uh, descended into the earth many centuries ago, and he will ascend out of the earth supernaturally and appear much in the manner that we think Jesus will appear. So he's kind of a counterfeit Messiah. Mm -hmm. They call him the Imam Mahdi, and they believe that he will appear to lead the Arabs to victory. 
But whether you're a Sunni or a Shiite, you believe that the entire Middle East will one day be led by an Arab caliphate. And I think out of this has come the idea that the Antichrist himself will be Muslim and that he will come present himself to Israel. They will recognize him as their Messiah and then he will turn out to be a false Messiah. I simply don't see this happening uh, from Scripture as we will uh, And of course the examine. fuel on the fire is the saber rattling in Iran. Yeah. It's Iran's march towards nuclear weapons. So all these things based with current events and, and the events going on in the Middle East are all pushing people to make a conclusion that's just not biblical. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, uh, and I quote from Zechariah, uh, chapter 12, verses 2 through 6, and I won't read the whole quotation, but it begins, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a, a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in siege against Judah and against Jerusalem. I think that's happening right now. Mm. They are in siege all around Judah and, and Jerusalem. In fact, they want Judah for their own territory. They call it the West Bank. But what does Zechariah say in response to this? He says, In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all people around about, on the right hand, on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited in her own place, even in Jerusalem. In other words, says Zechariah, Though these enemies surround Jerusalem, they're all going to be burned up. And this is quite literally repeated in several places in Scripture. The Islamic horde coming to destroy Israel, that is Judah, Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, will themselves be reduced to ashes. Now, this is not a game plan that I see resulting in the Islamic Mahdi becoming the Antichrist. Quite the opposite. It's, uh, it's the, the death and, and destruction of the Islamic forces. And we're so, going to look at the wars that are going to take place in the near future that are going yeah. to actually show how Islam is reduced to ashes. But I've got my Bible open to, to the book of Daniel. And you know, Daniel is a yeah. book that infuriates liberal theologians, you know, secular scholars, just makes him angry because Daniel certainly appears to know the future. He was chosen as a special prophet of God, wrote a series of prophecies on the last days that Scripture says would be sealed until those last days. And here we are, and we believe we're in those last days right now. Absolutely. And to me, Daniel just puts away the question uh, about an Islamic Antichrist once and for all. Uh, in Daniel 9:27 uh, <clears throat> and and or that is Daniel 9:26 uh, and 27, we have the prophecy of the Messiah followed by the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, followed by the arrival of the Antichrist, and all these events are linked together. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That's the crucifixion of Christ, but not for himself. People of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The prince that shall come is the Antichrist. And his people, that is his progenitors, uh, are mentioned here. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who were his progenitors? Well, the people that destroyed the city and the sanctuary were Vespasian, his son Titus, and then Domitian, the third in line in the Flavian dynasty, the finally Romans. destroyed Jerusalem. The Romans. They were all Romans. Yeah. And to, to read this very carefully, it says, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And then Daniel 9:27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. The he is grammatically linked with the word prince in Daniel 9.26. The prince is the Antichrist. He, the prince, shall confirm a covenant with the leaders of Israel for one prophetic week, that is seven years. And, and Bob, here's the thing. It is his signature on that document that starts the seven-year tribulation. So we have several uh, features linked together. But most importantly, they are the Flavian dynasty, that is Rome, 
the genealogy of that dynasty that comes down to the Antichrist who signs the seven-year covenant. He's called the prince. He's related to the Romans. He is a Roman. And Daniel chapter 11 spends many, many verses describing his genealogy in detail. It seems to be pretty clear to us. Now, yeah. where we get into the complications, and there have been many of these other books published, uh, you know, one after another, there seems to be no end of them now that uh, the Antichrist is a Muslim. And what they're doing is they're saying that those Roman soldiers that destroyed the city weren't really Romans. That's exactly. the argument. Th that they came from many other countries. Uh, Assyria, they came from... Uh, Aramea, uh, they came from uh, Asia Minor, and that they really weren't Romans, they were genealogically other people uh, related to the Arabs and the Muslims. Now, well, we have, have to recall one thing about the Roman army. When you became a Roman conscript, that is a draftee, or when you joined the Roman army, you placed your fist over your heart and you said, I pledge to worship Caesar as Lord and God on pain of death. Wow. And you got your dog tags, which hung around your neck on a chain, and from that point forward, you were a Roman citizen. It didn't matter where you were born, you were a Roman citizen subject to the decree of Caesar. Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we've got some surprises awaiting. Uh, <laughs> the, the Islamic armies. I really think that everybody should read Daniel chapter 11. Now, I, w I will warn you in advance that you will say one thing when you start to read Daniel chapter 11. You'll say, boring. <laughs> I hate genealogies. I don't want to read genealogies. But this genealogy is very exciting genealogy. Daniel chapter 11. And, and I'm going to turn my Bible, and I am going to read starting in verse 3. But what you have here is amazing. Daniel 11.3 says, A mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. That king is Alexander the Great, who stood up in the 4th century B.C., about 323. At 331 is when he started his rise to fame. But uh, by 323, he had conquered the entire civilized world, he and his armies. And he's called a mighty king. Well, out of Daniel's or out of Alexander's rule came four generals. Alexander uh, the Great died at a very young age, in his early 30s, of alcoholic poisoning, it is said. And four generals took over his position. They were Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And they are all mentioned here, particularly the last two, Ptolemy and Seleucus. Ptolemy got the rule of North Africa, and the Ptolemaic dynasty controlled the city of Alexandria. But Seleucus got the rule of the area that we know today as Iraq and Syria and Turkey. And so, so the general called Seleucus, uh, coming in the line of Alexander, became the head of the bloodline out of which will come ultimately the Antichrist. And the Seleucid line, or the Seleucid dynasty, as they are called, are Greeks, period. They are not anything but Greeks. And so, Daniel spends an entire chapter, uh, and, and I wish I could read it all and explain it all, but we have just a few minutes left. Gary, what's really fascinating about that to me is that's a prophecy, and it drives people crazy who don't believe the Bible, because Daniel wrote about these things that were going to come to pass in the future, yeah. and they actually came to pass, <clears throat> and when they did, what did the skeptics say? Well, he must have written about it after the fact or after it happened, but we know that he didn't. Guess who came out of uh, the Seleucid dynasty? A man called Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And Daniel 11.21 talks about him. And in his estate, that is to say in the Seleucid dynasty, shall stand up a vile person. This is da Daniel 11.21. To whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably, obtain the kingdom by flatteries, 
with the arms of a flood uh, the, uh, shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And this describes Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who is the Bible's great type of the Antichrist. He came out of the Seleucid dynasty. And in A.D. 164, he was overthrown by the, the dynasty of Jonathan <clears throat> and the great uh, armies of Israel, who uh, basically by a miracle overthrew him, cleaned out the temple, restored the temple, and guess what, Bob? They began a march, if you will, toward Israeli victory that brought them to the first century and the coming of Jesus. So you have here an Antichrist figure who came along in 167, was defeated in 164 B.C., and then a bit later on uh, you had uh, the armies of Israel and the Hasmonean dynasty uh, victorious. And guess who still continued to rule in that area? The Seleucids, right alongside the Israelites. <clears throat> and you come down to the time of Christ, and the Seleucids became fast friends with the Romans and fast friends with the Herodians. And by the time uh, you arrive at the decades just before the coming of Jesus, around 4 B.C., you have an interesting thing happening. You have the Seleucid dynasty, the, uh, a man who later became known as Caesar Augustus, and another man who became known as Herod the Great, and these were all very close confederates. Their bloodlines intertwine with each other. The Seleucids, the Herodians, and the royal houses of Rome all became such fast friends that they intermarried. And you have here the bloodline that came from Alexander down to down through Antiochus IV Epiphanes and down to the time of the coming of Christ, all intermarrying with each other, which brings you then to Roman rule in the first century. And the bloodline is brought right to the Flavian dynasty. That's the dynasty that destroyed the city and the sanctuary. And out of that dynasty will come the Antichrist. Now, this is all detailed. This is, I realize it's a complicated story, but I've tried to make it as simple as I can. You have all of the details of that dynastic flow from Alexander the Great down to the, the man who destroyed the city. That would be the emperor Titus, and on through Domitian. And you have that entire bloodline and as it evaporated out, Bob, guess where it went? Tell us. It went into Europe, mm. into the kings of Europe. The Roman Empire. The Roman Empire. And so the bloodline of the Antichrist uh, then becomes the story of the Roman Empire, the Middle Ages, and the latter days. Now, quickly, you have to say, well, wait a minute. If this is the case, how, how can the Antichrist possibly be Islamic. We have really two strikes against him. Number one, the Bible predicts that the forces of Islam will be destroyed in a war. And number two, we have documentation in Daniel that the people of the prince are going to be the forefathers of the Antichrist. They were the Flavians. They were the ones who intermarried with the Herodians and the Seleucids. And their genealogy is given throughout the entirety of Daniel chapter 11. Therefore, they're not Islamic. What can I say? Well, what you can say is, do we have anything to be worried about with Iran coming down and destroying Israel with nuclear weapons? Does Ezekiel have anything to say well, about that? Well, uh, we don't, but Ezekiel certainly does. And everybody knows the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39, Gog of the land of Magog. And we have here the great alliance of the latter days, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, the house of Togarma, the northern army that comes down to defeat Israel will include, by the way, the hordes of Islam from the, from the Arab Emirates, from Iraq, from Iran, from Syria, 
from Egypt, what's left of Syria and Egypt by that time, and that's another question. All of these hordes are the ones who come against Israel, and, and Bob, not only Zechariah, but also Ezekiel predicts that every last shard of those armies will be totally destroyed. It's a shocking annihilation. Annihilation of Islam. And when I say that, I say it with fear and trembling. Nobody wants a, a giant war. Nobody wants a world war. But the Bible talks about it so clearly. Now, we only have two or three minutes left, and I want you to have an opportunity once again to, uh, to learn about the Prophecy Watcher. Thanks for joining us today. I would love to tell you how you can become a subscriber to our wonderful Prophecy Magazine, creatively named The Prophecy Watcher. And ready for this? How you can get eight powerful Prophecy DVDs as a free bonus for subscribing today. It's a one-of-a-kind publication full of articles that will make you a Bible prophecy expert and prepare you for the future. We have a very special subscription offer for you today for your gift of $50 or more to support the worldwide outreach of Prophecy Watchers. You can subscribe to either the digital version or the print version of our magazine. And here's the best part. In addition to receiving 12 monthly issues of the magazine, this offer comes with a fantastic bonus eight DVDs from some of the leading prophecy experts in the world today. Eight DVDs plus 12 issues of the magazine represents a $200 value, but it's available today for your gift of just $50 or more to support the work of Prophecy Watchers. This offer is available anywhere in the USA and will ship both the magazine and the DVDs absolutely free. Don't wait or hesitate. Call the toll-free number on your screen or visit our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv to take advantage of this limited time offer. And I hope you will take advantage of that offer uh, because we consider ourselves to be right up in the front when it comes to uh, prophecy research, when it comes to things that are happening now that need a good explanation. Now, we have about a minute to talk about Ezekiel Ezekiel talks about the advancing army. It's comprised of Russia, Persia. Uh, it's comprised of North African and Northeast African forces. It's comprised of uh, the, the Turkish forces, the forces in the Middle East today, all coming together under uh, the, the, the military backing of Russia. And verse 2 of chapter 39 of Ezekiel says, I will turn thee back. Verse 3 says, I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and I will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Verse 12 says, Seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them, that they may cleanse the land. We've talked about this many times before, but that's the complete annihilation of the Islamic army. Complete annihilation. And this, once again, is all about God's chosen people goes back to the Abrahamic covenant that God made with Abraham and the nation of Israel. He promised to bless the people that bless Israel and curse the people that curse Israel. All these nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38, Syria, all these other Egypt, all these enemies, they're all going to eventually meet their destruction. And the man who rises out of the ashes of that war, who becomes the Antichrist, will be a friend of the Jews. Hardly an Islamic Something to think about, and I hope you will. Gary Stearman. We're watching. Why don't you keep watching too?